last week at the chapter 3 of the Gospel of Mark. Up on the screen is kind of the summary and takeaway from that. That what Christ was most critical of was not necessarily our sin, but of our hard hearts. So the hard hearts of the Pharisees. The Pharisees had just witnessed a man's hand being healed, restored to life. And what did they do? They went out to plot to kill Jesus. Their hearts were hard and our hearts can be hard as well. So that is what is Christ's desire of us to have soft hearts. And this theme will continue on through chapter 4. Let's begin verse 1. Reads, Again Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake. While all the people were along the shore at the water's edge, he taught them many things by parables. If you remember back in verse 9 of chapter 3, Jesus told the disciples, have a boat ready for me, because he knew the crowd was going to be big. As the crowd gets around him, presses around him, they're not there to hear him teach, and that's his primary reason for being here. He was here to teach, not to heal. But healing was a sign that pointed to his authenticity of teaching. He was out in the boat, and the people up on the shore, and the shoreline works way up the hill. Um, he's in somewhat of a natural amphitheater. Water, or sound carries quite well over water. And so the people could hear, none of them were looking through other people's head or anything, and he could see the eyes of everybody there. Now in just the fourth chapter, we're quarter of the way through this gospel, the crowds are being coming a detriment to his ministry. They're just becoming too much to manage. So he is trying to look for ways that he can distance himself enough that he can teach and get his message across. And then Mark tells us that he was teaching in parables. And parables are nothing more really than just an illustration. One of my mentors as I learned to do this thing that I do up here is Steve Brown. He's a preacher out of Maitland, Florida. He wrote a book, How to Speak So People Will Listen, and in that book he says, never teach anything that you can't illustrate. Never teach anything you can't illustrate. And so Jesus was the king here of illustrations, right? My degree, my engineering degree, is in engineering metallurgy. I'm a metallurgical engineer, and I spent my career in the foundry industry specializing in gray and ductile cast irons. It's a wide field. Metallurgically, it's a wide field. You can ask me about cast irons and I can answer it, but don't ask me about aluminum, bronze, titanium, etc., because I'm lost on those. <clears throat> it's a pretty complex science. And I had to deal with purchasing agents and engineers and foundry people who probably didn't even finish high school in many cases and had to explain to them what was the difference between these various metals we cast? And I got this illustration that I put together. Is imagine your casting is just a big jello mold. We've all seen jello molds at Grandma's house, Thanksgiving. <laughs> okay, at your house. Um, and imagine that in the gray iron, jello mold, there's a bunch of teeny tiny microscopic cornflakes randomly dispersed. And those are graphite flakes. And the difference in ductile iron is that you got the same jello mold, but those graphite particles are now in spheres or like cherries in the jello mold rather than the cornflakes. And so people would be able to understand that, picture that in their minds. And Jesus is telling us illustrations to develop the same type of picture. And by the way, you know right now more than about 70% of the purchasing agents buying iron castings in this country. 
this point when he starts teaching in parables like this is also a turning point in his life or in his ministry that he is speaking somewhat in riddles so that the message that he's telling for those who don't want to know is hidden. But the meaning for those that want to know can be found. Continuing on, and in his teaching said, listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came up and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns which grew up and choked the plants so they, they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up and grew and produced a crop multiplying 30, 60, or even 100 times. Then Jesus said, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Note in that paragraph, he started out with listen, and then he ended it with hear. Verse 10, when he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He said to them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given you, but those on the outside, everything is said in parables so that and he, here he's quoting that they may never that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving and ever hearing but never understanding otherwise they might turn and be forgiven and in Matthew's account of that it's found in chapters 13 but blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear for I tell you the truth many prophets and righteous men long to see what you see but did not see it and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And that reason they didn't hear it or see it is because the Messiah hadn't come yet. They were waiting for the Messiah to say it or show them, and he had not arrived yet. Here, the disciples are there with the Messiah. Note also in here, it's 12 plus, 12 and the others. There was more than just 12 following him, more than just the 12 that wanted to have a deeper understanding of what he was teaching. These parables then are a spiritual sifting process. Those that want to know will ask. Those that don't want to know will just, well, that's nice. He's talking about farming. Now he mentions here, but those on the outside, that would imply that there are some on the inside, right? Yeah. So, if you're on the inside, we get a special ring and a secret handshake and a hat. And no, it's just we on the inside are the ones that want to know Christ, that want to desire. Or we have the desire to have a deeper understanding of what he's teaching. And if we look at what we learned in chapter three of the hard hearts and the Pharisees with their closed minds, we have a better understanding of how not to be. And I'm sure you've been situations where you've run across people that didn't want to listen. Their mind was already made up, you know, and they're sitting. You know you've lost them. And there are folks that sit in church for years like that and never, never hear the right message. And Jesus here in the last of that paragraph is referencing Isaiah 6.10. Make the heart of his people calloused, make their ears dull and close their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn and be healed. So it's a practice of Old Testament rabbis. They would mentioned just a portion of a scripture, and since most Jews memorize the scripture, they would know the full context. Just like saying the punchline out of a show, and then you'd understand the whole show, you know, the, done with our kids at least. Later, Paul wrote, 
in his letter to the Corinthians that even our gospel is veiled. It is veiled to those who are perishing. A God or the God of this age and that God of this age is Satan has blinded our minds, blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. Now when when Jesus gets alone and he's with the 12 and the others, I can imagine that Peter's the one that said, Lord, we're fishermen. You know, we've seen farmers. We know enough. But I'm sure Peter was the one that asked, explain this to us. And later when Peter wrote his epistle, the first book of Peter, in the first chapter, he says, for you've not for you have been born again, not of perishable seed. He remembers this parable that Jesus taught earlier, where he's calling the word of God the seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. Verse 13, then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? And right here, Jesus is telling them that this parable is key to understanding how people will receive the gospel. Verse 14, the farmer sows the word. Here, Jesus is sowing the word. And in the future, his disciples will be sowing the word. And in the future, it'll be up to you and I to sow the world through the Great Commission going into all the world and making disciples of all men. The seed is the word. There's a scripture in Leviticus that says, do not sow different kinds of seed. And we have to be careful when we're sharing the gospel, when we're in a pulpit, that we do not mix the seed. Jesus didn't say anything about the sower, the farmer. He didn't say anything about the seed. The farmer is irrelevant. It's whoever is faithful to share the message of Christ. It doesn't matter what they're wearing, um, etc. That doesn't make a difference, nor should the seed change. And when we look at church attendance, what are the two things we think we need to change? Well, let's put up a different light or chain, paint the sanctuary or, or go to PowerPoint or uh, praise band. And maybe we should water down the message a little bit so it's more socially acceptable. Here Jesus tells us that the seed and the sower do not change. Well, what's the variable here? And the variable here is this, uh, the soil. But before we get there, Paul also write, wrote to the Thessalonians, we, and we also thank God continually because when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but as it actually is the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. The word, the seed, should never change, should never be adapted to fit whatever the popular position is of the day. Verse 15. Some people are like seed along the path where the word is sown. As they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown on them. Now, in some of your Bibles, it will say the parable of the sower but re or the parable of the sea. But really, this should be the parable of the soils, because that's what he's comparing here. The soils, the different soils that the seeds fall on. The path here that Jesus is talking about is hardened. It's like concrete in Mideastern fields in Israel. Israel has more rocks than the Barnett's farm. And as they would clear the rocks from the field, as we do here, and put them to the edge of the field, and their fields might be an acre, and their neighbor's field is right next to them, and so everybody would pile their rocks along the property line, and before you know it, you have a stone wall. 
And so that you're not walking all over your crops, you walk along this wall and it develops paths. So it's a hard, rocky path where the seeds have no means of getting a start. And here Jesus is equating the birds to Satan, taking the seeds as they're scattered, not even penetrating. And what he's talking about here is a hard heart. People's hearts so hard, you know, the guy with his arms crossed, so hard, not even listening. The danger is when we recognize somebody with a hard heart that we might give up on them. He'll never, he'll never come to Christ. He's a lost cause and just never share with him again. That's the danger. Verse 16. Others like seed sown on rocky places hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. These are shallow hearts. We might have seen those. You know, we might have somebody start attending church for four, five, six weeks, and then we never see them again. Those that have come to Christ, maybe through an emotional plea or the willful manipulation by some evangelist. But as Jesus said here, when it costs them something, they turn away. Well, God didn't answer my prayers. Still in bankruptcy. Not going back to him. Or how could a God of love allow such a thing to happen? I'm not going to have anything to do with that. A very shallow belief without roots. Verse 18, Jesus says, Still others like seed sown among thorns hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. There's a couple farmers in here and people that have gardens and lawns, and you know that the weeds are the, the bane of your existence, the challenge to all good crops, that it is a natural condition of the soil to sprout weeds and not what we want, and it's the same thing with our hearts. Our hearts, if left untended, will grow weeds and distractions and be filled with all sorts of things other than what Christ wants us to have. It's a matter of struggling between two kingdoms. We want to be with Christ. We want to have, be faithful to God, but we also want to be of this world. Or we're too busy for God. Too many other things going on that we can't serve God or attend church. We want to be good parents and provide our children with all the opportunities we can. And so they're an indoor soccer or Sunday basketball league or whatever the case may be. And they're having a full life at that time, but depriving them of the roots and the nutrition they need for later in life, that spiritual nutrition that we need to continue on and serve. Verse 20, others like seed on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop. 30, 60, or even 100 times what was sown. Those are the hearts, the good fertile soil, the soft hearts that will accept the teaching of Christ. How many pieces of grain do you get on a wheat stem for each you get one stem for every seed you put in the ground. And what do you get, 20, maybe 30 on a head? Okay, 30. So here Christ is saying 60 or 100 times what you plant is the fruitfulness we'll have from that 25% that listen, that have the soft heart. Seed 
75% of the time that we share, they're not going to listen. It's not going to be a fruitful interaction. And I heard that that's one of the reasons why so many young pastors drop out of the ministry. They realize that 75% of the people they talk to will never produce fruit, will never turn their hearts to Christ. Why would I want to do 30 years of this and be rejected? That's the bad news. The good news is, for that 25% of people that do accept Christ, the harvest is 30, 60, 100 fold. A very bountiful harvest. So Jesus here has outlined four heart conditions. The hard heart, the shallow heart, the crowded heart, and the open receptive heart. And this teaching raises some questions, doesn't it? I mean, really, the, the biggest question that comes to my mind is, where's my heart on here? You know, you really have to be honest with yourself, say, well, you know, I've got a fairly shallow heart or, or my heart's pretty crowded right now. And once you realize where you might stand on that scale, the next question is, can a hard heart be changed? Yeah, God uses situations all the time. He doesn't necessarily cause them, but he uses situations all the time to change a heart. And he did with me. Up until the time I was 20 years old, I don't believe I've been in the church more than what I could count on my hand. I was unchurched as a child. And as I grew older, you know, I thought, okay, I'll start attending church. I went through membership classes, got baptized with my oldest son, Stephen. And uh, we served our sentence in the church nursery and brought the flu home with our kids. And you all know about that type of thing. But it wasn't real at that time. My heart wasn't softened until... My first wife told me she didn't want to be married anymore. My life had been, my priorities had been family, work, and God. I mean, I worked to take care of my family. My primary responsibility was my family. And so by not being married, I lose my family. At the time I was working, that company was in chapter 11. We didn't know from week to week whether I'd drive up and the gates would be locked. And so all I had was the time to turn to God. Now I had heard testimonies over the years growing up about those drug addicts and drunks that were rescued from their disease by Christ. And I thought, well, that's good for them. But I'm not a drug addict, I'm not a drunk. But if I ever end up in a gutter, I'll know where to turn. And so God used are divorced to soften my heart to draw me to him Amen. he did not cause a divorce he does not want divorce but he used that softening of the heart to draw me to him when are people's hearts softened in crises like that or at funerals where a heart is receptive to hearing the message That can be a bit discouraging thought too, wouldn't it? If God uses tragedy and crises to change our hearts and draw us nearer to him, boy, I can't wait for the next tragedy so I can grow in Christ. <laughs> and that's, that's not true. We can, we can make that conscious decision to ask God to soften our hearts, to open our hearts to his teaching, to draw deeper into his word and a deeper relationship with him. All the way back in Proverbs, there was this wisdom. 
My son, if you accept my words and store up my commands within you, turning your ear to wisdom and applying heart to understanding, and if you call out for insight and cry aloud for understanding, and if you look for it as if for silver and search for it as if for hidden treasure, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Look for it as treasure, something that you value. Plead for understanding and he will give it to you. You don't have to wait for a crisis or tragedy or a sore mouth. <laughs>